So, okay, how long do you think I've been pestering you to come on the podcast? It's been a while. It's been well over a year, hasn't it? Yeah. And to be fair, I've been wanting to do it for ages. I just haven't been able to. And when you see me slide into your DMs and do it, you're just like, fuck, there's that guy again. What the fuck is he doing? No, I was really excited. Like, I'm a fan of your podcast and I think you're brilliant. So it is something I wanted to do. Yeah. I, I thought you were keen, but, you know, it was nice. So keen. <laughs> oh, my God. I couldn't be more keen. <laughs> but, but we met ages ago. Yeah. I was telling the guys, I, I, I think we met ages ago when uh, I was in Marbella. Yeah. I think I was drunk and I probably tried to flirt with you or something like that. I mean, I think everyone, including your friends, were a bit flirty. But oh I, was, I was trying God. to think about this the other day, right? And, you know, I actually almost got fired because of that. Do you sort of Are remember? You, what? Do you not really remember, like, the layout of what happened? Okay, I don't remember much. I was just, let's just, just for the record, everybody, I was very drunk, okay? And I was young and I thought I was really cool and I obviously no. was not. And I remember we met and what happened? So this was in, like, your party days. I think you was with Francis yeah. and, and your other friend, maybe Warren. I'm not mm. sure. Yeah. And me and my friends were working as promoters for, like, clubs. Yeah. And I think you guys were getting looked after. Basically, like, it was scintillate. We were promoting for them. Yeah. And you were out there and getting looked after by them. And we were meant to be in the streets, like, giving out leaflets and getting everyone to come in the clubs. And you guys were like, well, we're not going in the club if you don't come in with us. That's ridiculous. Like, just come in. No one's ever going to know. Like, you're not going to get in trouble. But we were meant to be working till, like, 2 a.m. <laughs> or something like that. So we knew it was wrong. But in our heads, we're just like, you know, we can't let down like the celebrity guest. Oh and my God. Oh my God. Honestly, I'm about to vomit on this side. Yeah. God, that's not, no Well, way. we were really excited. We thought it was going to be a laugh and we didn't want to work either, to be honest. But yeah. I think we all thought we'd get away with it and we all went to like TV restaurant yeah. and had like a crazy night out and it just ended up all over social media. <laughs> and like we got called in the office the next day. We got like our whole paycheck taken off us for that month. Are you serious? No, no, but that was a good thing because we were really entitled to get fired to be fair like no 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 hang on they took away your whole paycheck because i invited you for dinner no but we were meant to be working we were literally meant to be at work and we decided that we would just come with you guys and just completely <laughs> act like we were at work but really just have it off in the club which we're meant to be promoting so yeah, i owe you money you do sort of yeah how much money do i owe you oh what? probably not a lot like 400 euros uh, listen hey a deal a, a deal's a deal i gotta give you 400 euros i mean i'd ring the other boys tell them to put in because they were all they they, they <laughs> all cause this <laughs> oh my god but it was a good night it was worth it i think i miss those days sometimes. yeah being yeah. young and just like having fun i feel like now though as we get older like that kind of like social media kind of slightly ruined everything you can't then I remember when I was really young going to parties, no one ever knew what you were doing. You were just going out and having like a fun time and no one knew anything. I remember you standing on the edge of the oh table God. and there was all like girls trying to come around the table because you were just so famous at that time. And I remember you were like kissing them all on the cheek on the side of the face. You know, like almost like rock star vibes. Get out of here. No It was way. in TV. God, just my ego. You were working the crowd. I just thought I was so... I mean, if I was me now looking back at me then, I would just think, what a prick. Like, I honestly, for whatever reason, don't know, like... Uh, it was strange back then. And and I don't know about you, but I was always like so desperate to be on television and do television and yeah. be entertainment. Did you ever have that as well? Yeah, of course. Like like when I was around that age, I would see people like you guys and also the Towie guys absolutely smashing it. And like, it was really, really fun. And also like, when you look at things like that, it's just a bunch of people who are so excited to see you and meet you because yeah. they've seen you on TV. And like, why not be the person that puts on a show when you see them? Like... We're a bit old for it now, but when you first sort of get on the telly, it's just so excited to meet people and really just lap up the attention. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Essex. Whereabouts in Essex? In Loughton. Where's, Essex is like Texas. It's honestly enormous. So I feel like everyone sort of navigates their understanding of Essex around Sheesh. It's like Sheesh is a compass <laughs> and that's all anyone really gets. So I'm about 15 minutes from Sheesh. You, you're 15 minutes yeah. from Yeah. And do you still live there now or in the area? Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm in Abridge at the moment. Yeah. I'm actually living with my mum. Are you? Yeah. So it's a long story, but I had a flat somewhere that I don't really intend to go back to. So it's taken me a while to get the funds together to get another place. But I've had my mortgage accepted this week. Mm. So after like a year or two of staying back with my mum, I'm going to be moving back into my own place. And I love my mum, but oh my God, I can't fucking wait. Like... 
man living I, I remember lockdown i went down to my mom's house i love my mom right but honestly <laughs> that's how murders happen because i was going to kill her and hide her under the floorboards because she was honestly it was like living with like a school teacher i was like like i'm 30 or whatever i was back yeah. then so like, this is just crazy yeah i don't know why that happens so you you have a fact you don't want to go back to the flat Saying- no, so so my flat was opposite um, my ex partner's, which is obviously like quite a public thing. And because it was opposite his, when everything happened, I was like, "There's no way I can go back there." Yeah. So I had to. I just never went back there. My mum took all of my stuff out, which was quite upsetting. And that's when I ended up moving back in with my mum because, like, I couldn't even rent at that point. So I just had everything into that property. But you know, I think at this point now, if I wanted to, I could go back there. But there's just too much happened there. There's so many memories from like old friends as well. And I'm just so ready to move on. Mm. But yeah. How are you doing at the moment? I'm doing really well. I think I'm in a really good place at the moment. The best yeah. place I've been in in a long time. Because, um, I mean, look, you can talk about as much as you want to talk about or not talk about anything at all, right? What you've been through, shit, man. Like, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yeah, it's so uh, it's 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 tough going through that personally. Just doing that in you know talking about like social media and stuff like that, but going through that just silently is hard enough. Let alone it being in the press. Yeah, and having to deal with that just publicly and all those different things. Yeah. Um, but you're feeling okay now. Yeah, a lot better. And I remember you being one of the first people to reach out, like when yeah. it first happened, and I really appreciated that. And it was crazy because for so long. I couldn't speak about it, could I? So I wanted to come on the podcast, but I couldn't really do anything for a certain amount of time. And, you know, now I'm in a place where I've really got to speak about it and the whole public sort of have got behind me on it. And even though there's still things that do bother me about the situation, I've definitely moved on and definitely healed from it. Mm. It's funny, right? Because, um, and again, just honestly feel free what you want to talk about, right? What happened with you is your ex-partner, he... Uh, put out revenge porn. That's what someone would call it, right? Yeah, or image-based sexual abuse, they like to call it now. So can you explain the different terminology just so I understand it? So some, I mean, I've got an incredibly thick skin, believe it or not, so I don't get offended that easy by by like wording and stuff, but there's like a lot of victims who were getting very offended by the term revenge porn because firstly, it intended that they'd done something wrong to have to have that happen to them. So it's revenge when really a lot of them didn't even do anything to deserve it. Yeah. And then the word porn offends them too, because, you know, it technically wasn't porn, even for people that filmed it themselves. It was footage that was meant to be kept private. It wasn't in like intended to be porn or, Mm. you know, so I think they get a lot of people complain that it was offending them. So they've changed it to image based sexual abuse. Which is a mouthful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I get I get why because it, it's porn also has its sort of terminologies which can be offensive to some people in certain ways, and so you don't really want to say it's porn when it's yeah yeah. So image based sexual abuse. Yeah. Okay, and and your ex did you know did this to you? And I mean, how did you find out about it? How did that all? I mean, I, again, I don't want to bring you back to this terrible place, but. Just for my own knowledge, because I just don't understand how someone can do that. So it, it went on for a long time. From It wasn't like until it got really viral. That was about six months after the actual incident. So he admitted to having filmed it on the day and promised it wouldn't go anywhere. And to be honest, the more I tried to make a thing out of it, because we were still drunk at the time when he told me, the more he began to sort of gaslight me and be like, you know, you're going crazy. I would never do it on purpose. I didn't know the cameras were there. Like you always, you know, like you do forget that you're having sex for 20 minutes in front of your own camera. Mm. And like, yeah, he just sort of gaslit me to think like that I was just over exaggerating and I was making it into a thing that it wasn't. And I thought for a while it had gone away. I made it like implicitly clear that he was not to do anything with that footage and he was to delete it. And a few months later, I started hearing from like people around my area that he had shown them the footage Oh, man. Yeah, so so that to me was like horrifying, but also still, you know, this man's got his own career on track still. He's got a lot to lose. He's showing them, which is making me feel sick, but I still haven't heard that he's took the move to actually send it to anyone because that is when, you know, it's life-changing and people are going to find out. I'm so, so you're living in this constant state of anxiety where there's someone yeah. has you almost as a prisoner. Yeah. 
where you don't want to say anything to them to, I imagine, I'm just, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I imagine if it was from my position, if someone's had something almost like the way they were black, they, they could blackmail me. You don't want to say anything to them. You don't want to anger them. You don't want to upset them just in fear that they're going to put this image anywhere or send it to anyone. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was more just the fear of, is this going to go somewhere? And every time I did say something, either to him or any of his family, all they would say was that, you know, this isn't happening or that I'm not telling the truth. And it was like really starting to send me, send me mad because I knew that people had seen it because, you know, that video exists. So they're not making it up. Almost, the limbo stage was almost worse than actually finding out that it's out there now because I had so long of thinking, you know, how do I keep this quiet? Like, why, why would he keep doing that to me? Like, it was really upsetting. And after months of like constantly saying, look, he's showing people, I know he is. And all of the people that were telling me were young men. They didn't want to go to the police or make any sort of a formal statement, which, you know, I understood. And I also just appreciated the fact that they were telling me when so they didn't want So he was showing it. it to random people? He was he was showing it to people he didn't know very well. Yeah, yeah. Who for what reason? What what is what is the reason for someone to do that? That's what I mean. I, I'll never really understand it. I think to feed your ego, I suppose. He sort of got to the stage where I think this is the way that I actually always look at it. I think he was praised so much for being bad on reality television, for mm. being this person that treated women badly and done all these bad things, and still got all of this sort of love and support from the British public, that that almost blurred reality for him. And I think it got to a stage where he then wanted to be infamous in the real world. He wanted to play this villain role. And it's like he stopped, he forgot how to stop playing it when the cameras were gone. It's like he'd done it in reality as well. This is your ex, Stephen Bat, who you're talking about, right? And and I sort of understand that. I think that's what happens with a... It, it's funny, I, was, I spoke to an actor once who said acting is a psychologically quite, quite a hard thing when you do it for so long because you play so many characters. You actually forget who you are. Yeah. You forget your own emotions, especially if you go in-depth and you method into these things. That's what happens. And when I did Made in Chelsea for 10 years or whatever it was, I remember we would film like 160 days a year or whatever it was. It was crazy. I was doing it for 10 years. You know, in the scene of Made in Chelsea, what would happen is that same as you had it with, you know, your TV work, you probably have the same thing. You go into a scene or whatever it is, and in the scene, you do the first one, you're funny or you're entertaining or you're uh, good at arguing, whatever. And then you go onto Twitter or social media or whatever it is, and someone goes, oh my God, you're quite funny. And so yeah. you then go, oh, I've got to be funny in every scene. Yeah. So then you go into every scene, you have to be funny. And so then you become this heightened, volumed up version of yourself. Yeah. And then what happens is with in my position is that I did it for so long is that when I wasn't in a scene, I felt like I still had to be this person all the time. And so I definitely, yeah. that sense of reality and what was real and what wasn't kind of got blurred. Yeah, like you struggled to take things seriously totally, or just be yeah. calm. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. So that's that's what ha obviously what happened to him. So you're in this situation and this this video of you and him, you know, this is you're in a relationship with this guy. Not at the time. Not at no, the time, but before, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we'd we been in a relationship on TV shows. So yeah. we'd done the challenge together and we filmed it together for eight weeks in the Namibian desert. So yeah. it was literally us two and like two other English people and loads of American people we didn't know. So it was quite intense for that amount of time. But like we'd also, you know, we had a really close friendship. We lived opposite each other. Like we filmed together multiple times and it was, yeah. Did you love him at any point? I wouldn't ever say I looked at him as someone that I would think, look, I could settle down with you and have a relationship with you and this will go somewhere. But definitely when we were first on the challenge, I had love for him. Yeah, I did love him at the time. Not as intensely as a serious relationship, but yeah, I did. I had a lot of love for him. That's hard, right? It must yeah. be really hard. Yeah, and I'd, I'd already been, always been good to him and kind to him. So that's quite hard as well. How, how closed off does it make you as an individual? Because, I, you know, I, I, maybe I'm sort of reading into it a little bit, but, and, I'm, and again, I'm going to put it on myself. If, if something like this happened to me, I'd find it so hard to trust people. Yeah. And I, and I wouldn't know what I can say or what not to say or talk about or whatever. Do you, do, do you find it hard to talk about it? Um, I, I mean, I've got quite used to talking about it now and I definitely yeah. think it helps, but in a way I do. 
Like, I think at the time when I'm talking about it, I feel okay. Yeah. But then sometimes, like, throughout the day, I can feel a bit, like, a bit low. And I think, oh, why, why do I feel like that? But it's just my body. The amount of people that have, that have been victims to this is yeah. wild. And I only noticed that because, like I said, I reached out to you when it happened. And, and then I could just see in the press and see the comments and see, this happens so much. So much. And the amount I see it on social media take, takes my breath away. But I've also now got to the point where everywhere I go, I so often have people coming up to me crying, like feeling really overly emotional, saying, you know, it's happened to them and they've, they've never really had anyone to talk to about it. And they, and they love to speak to me about it. And it's crazy to think that I can go to so many places and there's always at least one or two victims in there. That's pretty amazing that you get to, to yeah. be a voice for yeah. these women, men, whoever it is. Yeah. Having had, you know, cause I don't think there's a, uh, I'm sure there is a spokesman, but being a spokesman, you must help so many people. Yeah. And I definitely feel like I have, and that's the one positive I can take from this. I know it's made a big difference to lots of young men and women. And also hopefully it can be a bit of a prevention because I think like seeing my story will put a lot of people off of causing this, of doing this sort of a crime because they can understand how damaging it can be and also what the consequences can be. Just, just, uh, just I, before we move on, because I know this, we, we don't want to dwell on this, but what does it do to someone's mental state? How, how, what do you, what happens, what happened to you in terms of your head? I always say like, I, I can really compare it to grieving and it's something that comes on in like waves of emotions. And like, sometimes you're not sure if, if you're entitled to feel that way or not. But the main thing you usually feel is just ashamed, really, really hurt. And you just sort of, you lose a part of yourself for a while. It really makes you devalue yourself in a way. And I think for people that don't get to talk about it, it can eat them up inside, to be honest. Yeah, you got to be open and talk about it, right? Yeah. You feel violated, that's the word. Oh, you man. just feel absolutely violated. That's the that's the best word. Yeah. Um okay, so you're you're campaigning against uh image-based sexual abuse. Yeah. And uh, how does the campaigning work? So actually my my reason for campaigning was to amend the law, which I successfully done about I think a month or two about a month or two ago now so I'm probably going to have to choose a new campaign but the way it worked was firstly I was doing lots of television appearances mm -hmm. where I got to meet some really influential people so on GMB I met Ed Balls and I just he's like, a good dude he's great yeah he's a good he's dude. great and, and he opened some doors for me and I said look I really feel like this needs to change and he was like well I, I reckon you can do it and he put me in touch with some MPs and I ended up meeting with Caroline Noakes, who's an MP, and she's a massive campaigner. And she asked me to come down to the Houses of Parliament, which I was shitting myself to do. I was yeah. like, I can't believe they're letting me in from Tower <laughs> to Parliament. Um, <laughs> and it literally just went from there. she done everything she possibly could to get it into motion. And in the meantime, i just done what I could to support charities with whatever campaigns. I think at one point I was with Women's Refuge and we were all outside Parliament with, like, campaign boards and everything, like, proper, like, old school campaigning wow they didn't want me to burn my bra but i would have they, no. oh god that's epic <laughs> yeah that must be really like empowering yeah it is really empowering i think it's still sinking in that it it had the effect that it did that's insane it, it does make me think though and worry and i don't know what your thoughts are just on people who you know decide to do only fans at such a young age and then realize they can't take images back it does worry me a little bit i don't know what do you think about that yeah i think i think it it is it's looked at as not the porn industry but a lot of the time it ends up that way and i just yeah. think for young girls you've got to really think of don't think about like how much money you want today or how much money you want right now think about who you want to be in five to ten years like what you want to achieve and if that is someone that works in the porn industry then go for it do you know what i mean that there's always going to be people that do enjoy that but if that isn't, then you need to really have a think about it before you let these images and videos go onto the web where they could potentially be out there for the rest of your life because they may stifle you in, in future careers. That is so right. You, 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 it's too short term sometimes, I think yeah. people think. And you've got to think long term. Yeah. If you're happy with that, then so be it and good on you and yeah. that's great. But if you're umming and ahhing or you're just presented with some cash and you think it's going to be quick cash, 
Maybe not yeah. the best idea to do it, right? And that's why I've never done it. Like a lot of my friends will be like, look, we're making like a hundred grand a month. Are you serious? And yeah, I will especially like select people that are celebrities or, or reality yeah. stars. And they're like, you know, all we have to do is be in our underwear or like a lot of my friends will be on the side of like swimming pools and they'll just slap their bum on the water like that. And like they're literally making so much money. But for me, I, I didn't ever want short term wow. money. I wanted to do, be like a presenter or you know, be someone in television that's taken quite seriously. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't do that. But I look at them and I think, do you know what? Slap that ass. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you're literally, you're Fuck making a yeah. hundred grand, but yeah, grand? it's very tempting. hundred yeah. grand a month? Some of them, yeah. Yeah. That's 1.2. And guys. And guys. I know some guys from Love Island that make like a lot as well because there's less men on there. But yeah, I, it's so Are they tempting. quite secretive about it or no? Um, not not many of them. No, yeah, they're just out there doing it. Well, if you if you're doing it, why not do it? Yeah. So, but that's what I mean. You got to th for them. That's what they want. They want they want short term money, and they don't care in ten years time because they're never going to want to do any sort of a public career in the future. But for me, I would love to be a presenter. I'd love television. I want to carry yeah. on doing what I'm doing. So I would never take the short term money because there will be a stigma attached to me in the future. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think never take it short. Short. Always look at the long term goal. Yeah. But you, you, but you've done them. You, you've changed the laws. Yeah. This, this is insane. Like yeah. that is insane. So, just quickly explain. So, the laws now changed to what? So we've managed to get an amendment in the law. So before you had to prove that there was an intent to cause distress. Yeah. So I always say it's like if I like threw a glass of water in your face and someone was like, you shouldn't do that, and they're like, well you know prove why you shouldn't have done it it's like you shouldn't have to prove why you shouldn't do a bad thing you just shouldn't do it and so many girls weren't managing to get a conviction because they didn't have very obvious evidence that the man proved to hurt their feelings or whatever it was it was quite ridiculous so they've now removed that loophole so anyone who sends explicit images or videos without consent full stop can face up to six months in prison and then the intent will then come in on if there was an intent to cause distress, it can go up to 21 months. Wow. Yeah, which was amazing. That's insane. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. Thanks. It was like so crazy going into the Ministry of Justice. and like, What is that like? Oh, it was just really overwhelming. Like I was so nervous and I don't usually get nervous. I had to meet um, Alex Chalk and he was like telling me about how the law's changing and I just didn't know what to say. You know, we were just thinking like, don't, <laughs> don't be funny. Don't just like, what do you do? I don't know. But it was amazing. That's incredible. You, you know, we go through life and we have these like milestones that we want to hit and we want to do different things. And, you know, how, going and changing a law for the better. Yeah. You know, that's a, an amazing thing to achieve and do in, 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 some, in one's life. Yeah, no, it really is. And I wanted to do it, but I never in a million years thought it would happen this quick. And like the government responded so quickly, like they really did listen. And I think as much as things like social media and people having a voice can be somewhat negative to society now, it also shows how people having a voice on social media and platforms to really speak about serious things can actually help as well because it can help sort of blur the lines between normal people and MPs and then being able to hear our issues are much easier. What are your views on social media now? What do you think about social media? I just think it needs to be regulated, full stop. And, and that's what the online safety bill is going to do. And I think, you know... This is insane. I love, this is so wicked. Yeah. Yeah, keep, keep going, keep going. Yeah, no, I just think it's great. I'm so with you. I think it needs to be regulated 100%. Yeah, it needs to be regulated. I always say it's just like... It's like the normal world's regulated, so why isn't the virtual world when people are spending almost more time in the virtual world as they are in reality? Mm. And I think it's just algorithms as well. You need to think about what you're looking at as well because whatever you're looking at, you're going to get pushed more of. So like, you know, sometimes like maybe I would always just look at all different girls and like them looking perfect and what they're wearing and what their clothes are and what jewellery they, they have. And that can sort of end up making you constantly compare yourself to others. So even though my feed's still a bit more like that now, I also look at spiritual teachers. I look at inspirational posts. I look at funny podcasts or girls that are sort of being relatable and showing their imperfections to make sure that whatever I'm looking at is actually giving me something for that day instead of just making me compare myself to others. It's funny though, it takes us a while to stop us comparing to others. Yeah. I, I don't know why we do it. 
I know, it's awful. It's freaking awful. I know. But I heard this <clears throat> crazy statistic, right, which is where we're meant to know 150 people typically. We're meant to have this village mentality. So we're meant to know 150 to 200 people. And out of those 150 to 200 people, we're meant to have our USP, our unique selling points. So something that makes us special. That can be we're the best at art, the best dancer, the best one at running races, the best one at, I don't know, rollerblading. So we all have our thing that makes us us. And so out of our village mentality, they go, oh, there's Jamie. He's great at doing the high jump. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> Problem with social media is that you now uh, wake up, instead of 200 people, you wake up to a million people all the time and everyone seems to be doing better than you are. Yeah. So you're constantly comparing ourselves. So when we're constantly comparing ourselves to other individuals who do the high jump or whatever it is, we use our, lose our sense of self. So yeah. then we give up on what we're meant to be doing because we think, well, we're never going to be as good as that person. We're never going to be as pretty as that person. We're never going to be as smart as that person. So we start giving up and then it actually leads us to not achieving what we should be achieving. That's a really weird way of looking at it. Like, that's not how <laughs> yeah. things were meant to be, is it's it? It's freaking not. We, we uh, like, sorry to get deep on it, but we were it, like, the whole point of social media was meant to connect people. And actually, we've led ourselves to such disconnection because of it. Yeah. It's like not a good thing. Yeah. Would you take away social media? You could, or would you keep it? <gasps> I don't know. How would I pay my bills, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> I think we would find other ways. For sure, we would find... I agree with you, though. On that side of things, it's good, though, right? Because yeah. you can get money out of it yeah. and stuff like that. But at the same time, I don't know about social media. Look, for us, it's a career. But honestly, if, if I had the option to not have to be on my phone, like, for for long periods in the day, I would absolutely love that. Mm. Like, and I think if I'd if I done a career that didn't involve social media so much, I, I wouldn't be using it as much as I do whatsoever. Mm. My God. I just want to say this one thing and then I can move on. You know, Steve Blair, he's, he's been sentenced to prison. He's in uh, 21 uh, months in prison. And um, I'm going to say, you know, it's a fucking good thing. Yeah, uh, yeah if I'm honest. I, I do want to talk about you. You have a book as well. Yeah, yeah. It's called Taking Back My Power. Amazing. Tell me about yeah. this. What's the pro I, I wrote a really bad book once. <laughs> My book is the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my life. It was it was called what was my book called? It was called um, I Can Explain. What the fuck can what I? Was you explain it exactly because I'm so crazy. <laughs> Whoa, I'm wild. I can explain. I can explain. Yeah, it was really bad. It wasn't. Is it that was. like if you've been caught for something, you go, I can explain. I think the idea was was that I had done so many crazy things in my life that I need to explain them, and honestly, no one read it. And as I was writing it, I said to the publisher, "By the way, guys, no one's going to read this," and they still went forward with it. I don't know why. At but, least you were honest. Yeah, I, I was trying to be honest. Tell me about your one. So. <laughs> You make me feel better now. Great build up. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. So mine's just sort of about the last couple of years. Like it, it will touch on some traumatic things that's happened because there were some other things that happened to me around the bear, it, a bear around the bear incident over the last couple of years. Mm. And you know, before all of these issues did come across my path, when I was younger, I was always obsessed with self help books. I've just always loved meditating. I've always loved sort of tasks that can help build your mental strength and I've just been weirdly obsessed with it I don't know why and I really feel that so many of those skills helped me get through the times that I've had and I really just want to sort of note down what I've been through but also try and give my readers like some tasks and some skills that they can do to navigate themselves through traumatic times because mm. I think life's just like a beautiful mix of having to be resilient mm. and also having to be grateful. And in the times when you're really up and everything's going well for you, you just need to try and bask in gratitude the best you can. And in times when things just really aren't going your way, you have to really pull together, be resilient and do some research on how to navigate your way through things because everything does turn around eventually. But sometimes it can just feel like you've got absolutely no hope. And I just want my readers to know that when they are feeling hopeless, there are ways of getting through that and hopefully be inspired by me doing so. How, how When you feel hopeless, how do you get through it? What do you do? I think you have to give yourself time to grieve in certain situations. Like it can't be good to bottle up emotions. Eventually it can really bring you down. But I think the best thing to do is meditate for one, like being able to control your thoughts and understand how your body's feeling is mm. so important shut yourself off from your phone, like literally just stay present and concentrate on doing tasks with friends and family members until you feel mentally well enough to get back out into the real world. When I was younger, I was not reading self-help books. I was trying to snog whatever girl left, right and centre. I was just thinking about like, fill me with like endorphin, 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 endorphin all the time. And I think that was my downfall in later life. Why were you obsessed with the self-help? 
Well, did you never read The Secret? I never read it. Yeah, so so I read The Secret and honestly, it really changed my life. I feel like I was quite a negative thinker when I was younger. Like Really? Yeah, like, look, I was still cool, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> I, I just think, like, I would always, I always thought, like, you know, I didn't think that you could dream big. I was never someone who would wake up and think, you know, I can do or be anything. I thought the world just gave you whatever it wanted to give you and you just had to sort of get on with it. Wait, why did you think that, though? What, what gave, why? Just because that's what you just... Because I just never was under the impression that the way that our, the way that we think and the way that we act could have some sort of control on how our reality is. I thought reality was just served to you if and when it comes. But a lot of people still think that. But how do you know that's not true? See, I just genuinely believe that our thoughts in some way do control our reality. And I think like where, from practicing manifestation, yeah. as soon as I got given the secret, I started to change my mindset. I thought, do you know what? Fuck it, might as well give it a go. Do you know what I mean? Got nothing to lose. And I just started trying to manifest certain things. I started trying to think about what I could attract in my life. And I even remember thinking, oh, you know, I think I could go on Towie. But before that, I never would have thought anything like that. And it wasn't something I went out and done physical things to try and bring into my path. Like I didn't like, don't know, ring up Arge and be like, you're right, mate, <laughs> fancy a cup of tea. <laughs> things just started to happen naturally in my physical world. And they really seem to be reacting to the change in my thought process. And I've always been a believer ever since. And like, you must know some people who are just unlucky, like everything always goes wrong for them. And you just think, oh my God, like, how does it happen to you all the time? Like, it's mm. draining. But it's genuinely so unlucky. Like something bad just consistently always happens to them. Or other people know people that are so positive and so lucky, probably a bit like you, and everything just happens to fall into their lap. And you're like, how is this geezer managing to pull this off? It's just mm. not normal. And that has to have some sort of a correlation to our mindset and how we hold ourselves in society. It can't just be a coincidence. See, I, I'm totally with you, by the way. Like, there, there are some wild things that, that have happened in my life that I've just been like... But but I think it's funny how I just, I think I would naturally, when I was younger, I was just a sort of optimistic thinker. Just, just I was always... I think some people were just like that. Yeah, I, I think, think some I people was. were just born to manifest and attract things, but other people aren't. But those people don't have to carry on that way. They can choose to change their mindset and change the way that they're thinking and their reality will change with it. But yeah, but but you have, that, that's a hard thing because I have someone really close to me who... Um, I would say is the sort of negative thinker. They're an actor and they really struggle with rejection and things like that. And I almost think even when before they go to an audition, they're thinking, well, I'm not going to get this. And that negative thinking yeah. bleeds into it, right? And yeah. the the a casting director or whoever can feel that. You can feel that sort of defeatist attitude. You have to switch that in your mind and just try and be positive. But then the arguments would some would say is that, okay, yeah, but your life's fine. I have to worry about this, this, and this. I have to pay my bills. I have to do all these and things. I can't think positively because everything is so bad. So if someone was saying that, how? what would you say to them in order to switch their mind? Literally just kid yourself. So it, it's about believing that you are worthy to be where you are or get the job that you're going to get. Like there is so much more to human communication than just the five senses. Like we can actually sense things that aren't said from each other. So if you're walking in feeling like you don't deserve something, immediately the interviewer will sense that and i think are you serious you think that's a definitely a thing i 100 percent think that's a thing yeah you see, really yeah you give that energy and that vibe across yeah i believe that humans really can sense more than what they realize about what what you think about yourself and i think if if you're a really negative thinker and you say look my life is in quite a rubbish place right now i'm, I'm going to find it hard to get rid of these faults that's where you need tools like meditation because meditation teaches you to be aware of your thoughts. And if you can't make them positive, you can at least let them go. And then books like The Secret, there's actually one called The Magic by Rhonda Byrne. Boring. I don't know how you say it. <laughs> and it's the follow-on from The Secret. And it, every day for 28 days, you have to do a task. And it's meant to change the way that you see the world. It's meant to make you think more positive thoughts, more gratitude and stuff like that. And so people that really don't feel like they're going, their lives going well right now, they just have to start with the smallest things. Like just be positive for the roof over your head. Just be positive for the health of your family. Be positive for the breath of fresh air you took this morning. And when you feel a thought coming in of, you know, how am I going to pay that bill? 
just think, you know what, well, I've been thinking these thoughts for years and it's not helped me. So let's just push the thought of the bill out of my mind for now and concentrate on the fresh air. And the more you do that, the more you can flip the ratio of your mindset and you suddenly start looking for more things to be positive and you start managing to put the things that sort of harm you in the day to the side, especially if you can't control them. And I can guarantee if they manage to do it just for a couple of weeks, they'll see their reality change and they'll see their luck change. And it only takes one small thing to completely flip the way you look at the world. But you have to be willing to really commit to thinking in a different way. So this is unbelievable. You should definitely push and promote this more. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, 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 firstly, it's so authentic. Yeah. Like you're not, you don't have a ulterior motive. You don't, you're not gaining anything by saying that. You just actually generally really believe it. Yeah. And which is a great thing. And I, I'm with you. I'm with you on so many things. Yeah. You should really promote and push this. Yeah. Because <clears throat> you've obviously, you know, we, you know, we know what you've been through as well, but it, it feels like you've been through some other tricky times potentially and that's what's got you through them. Yeah, 100%. Just like a faith, like a higher faith in the universe and that things will work out. And also like an inner knowing that we, we all only get one life and 100% throughout your lifetime, shit is going to get thrown at you. And when that shit gets thrown at you, you just, you just have to be strong and know that, you know, good times are going to eventually be around the corner. Because like life's always like this. It goes down a bit and then it goes up and then it goes down then it goes back up. But you're always gradually climbing. You just sometimes don't realise it. And if it wasn't like that, it would just be like that. And how boring would that be? Yeah, life is like a heart monitor. It has to go up and down in order to survive. Yeah. 100%. I totally agree with you. Yeah. That is... So, but th have you had therapy before? Yeah, I have. I've, I've had different forms of therapy. Because um, you're really well versed. You, you, you understand... And, and even more than just, again, I just repeating myself, but even more than just speaking it and just saying it, right? Like you're, you're reciting everybody, you're saying it from the heart. Yeah. So, so you, that's what needs to happen in order to fix yourself. You can't just read something and then just um, recite it, like just say it back to yeah. someone. That doesn't work. You actually need to read it, believe it, hear it, go, no, this is what, like, in order for things to change. Yeah. I think you need to practice it. And you always need to remember like, thinking differently doesn't cost a thing. No. Like, so so what are you losing in doing something differently for a week or two? What are you losing in believing in yourself? And so many people are too scared to believe in themselves. Like they think they don't deserve to have a better life or they don't deserve to have the career that, that would be the career of their dreams. Like they're too scared to even let their mind go there because it's just installed in them that they won't, they won't get it. But why not just try and believe in yourself for a bit? And if it doesn't work out, you're only back in the same situation you were in anyway. Fucking hell. This is unbelievable. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Okay, so you, you've had therapy and things like that. So have you dealt with anxiety and things in the past? Yeah, 100%. Like anxiety is just like an inner feeling, isn't it? Yeah. It's an inner feeling. And I'm reading a book called, called Letting Go, which is really good. And it sort of explains how like, Everyone has these certain emotions, but like there's ways of you like acknowledging the emotion and being like, right, there's anxiety in me, but I'm not anxious. Like a lot of people will say I'm anxious because they feel that feeling, but you know, it's just in you and you can acknowledge it and try and let it go rather than let it define you. Someone said to me, you've got to be the sky, not the cloud. We're the sky, oh, the yeah. anxiety is just the cloud going across, just let it go. And yeah. you just have to, you, you can acknowledge it, see it fine, but you're, you're not the cloud. Exactly. It always passes and moves on. But if you cling on to the cloud, then it becomes a rainstorm. And you, yeah. that's not a good thing. I'm very bad at that. What, I, clinging on? Yeah, I cling on to that shit. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't imagine you being like that. I do. I cling on to it. Like, I, like, I, like when I was in my early 20s, I had like a, I, again, I've said this before, but I had a bad panic attack. And um, I don't know what the fuck was going on when I had it, but I had a panic attack in like my early 20s doing MIC stuff with this. And then I basically had like general anxiety disorder for like six, six months. And I just told no one. Oh. I just kept it in. Didn't say one thing to anyone. And then when I was in a shower one day, I just said, what the fuck is wrong with you, Jamie? And I started crying and probably around the time I saw you in my bed. And uh, it actually literally was around that time. I swear yeah. to God, that, like around that time, it's when I was dealing with that, that had that panic. And I finally said it out loud. And I finally went and spoke to my mom who took me to a doctor. And they said, you have anxiety. I said, well, what's that? And they said, oh, it's this thing that's, you know, your adrenaline's quite high and you just need to relax. And I said, well, what can I do to get rid of it? 
They said, you, you can't, you just have to get past it. You just have to ride you it. You just have to ride it out. But honestly, yeah. I didn't tell, I didn't speak about it. I didn't tell anyone. I was embarrassed about it. Yeah. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty tough, I think. You definitely shouldn't be. I, I think our body holds repressed emotions as well. Explain that. What do you mean by that? So I feel like if you have an emotion, say say I say I don't know, I sat with a guy or something, mm. and then he didn't call me the next day, and you know, really that actually really upset me and, and made me feel feel like shit. But I didn't want to think about it. I just thought, you know, I'm just going to put that. I'm just going to ignore it. Like I don't care. I didn't care anyway. And you just carry on and you move on and you just keep pushing it down. I think when you have all really different situations like that in life, if you keep pushing down emotions and you keep choosing not to acknowledge them, eventually the body has a really strange way of just bringing them all up. So that's why like anxiety and stuff like that can come at times when it's so random and you don't even know why you feel like that because you're having a great day. It's because you, you're you not processing your emotions properly and healthily. And it's so important that when you do genuinely feel upset by a situation in life that you give yourself time just to acknowledge, you know, okay, this upset me, but it's not a big deal. Like I, I'm, I'm going to be upset about it for a little bit and I'm just going to let it come out. That's highly emotionally intelligent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but again, I go back to what was your home life like? It was good. It was good. I mean, my mum and dad broke up when I was younger, but I was How always, old were you when that happened? I was two. Oh, okay, fine. Two, yeah. I was eight. That was a real primitive age. I was... Yeah. <laughs> well, that fucks you up, that does. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you get on with your dad? Yeah, I get on really well with my dad. I mean, my mum and dad didn't get along well when I was growing up. So that's always like a bit awkward for a child to sort of process. But they both love me very much in their own right. Are so. you only child? No, I've got three brothers and sisters, but they're my half brothers and sisters with my dad. Okay, fine. And they're all really young. So like my oldest sister's 18 and then I've got a twin brother and six sister that are 16. So then when you go and do something like Love Island, yeah. do they freak out? Well, they love it. Yeah, they like really <laughs> yeah. enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? But then it comes part, part and parcel as well because obviously... I really loved like making them proud and stuff on TV shows. But when everything did happen with me, I was mm. so worried about like it affecting them in school and stuff like that. And for a little while it did, you know, and I think oh, also like having like a, I guess famous, I don't really call myself famous, but, but yeah. a famous older sister can have its like ups and downs and implications. So. I never, I, do you know what, naively, I didn't even think about the implications it has on family members, not just yourself when you go through something. You're like one of a herd, aren't you? you? you oh my God, eight. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, honestly, it's just crazy. But I, but I didn't even think like that. Like if something happens to you like that, then it, it affects all everyone, your love, yeah. everyone. Yeah, because the whole world knows about it. What was Love Island like? I loved it, but I went in as a bombshell. So I was only there for like two weeks. Yeah. And honestly, all I'd done before that was Towie. Then I went back to work in my office, which I enjoyed, don't get me wrong, but I knew wasn't the life for me. Like I was So after Love Island, you went back into the office? Yeah, yeah. What was the office? No, job? after after Tower, I went back in the office, but I actually went a little bit after Love Island as well. <laughs> Wait, hang on. What was the office job? The office job, I was a PA to a CEO of a financial consultancy firm. It was all very serious. And they yeah. said, don't worry, go and like do Love Island things. They were totally cool with it. They were so cool with it. But like as I went to leave, like, as my foot <laughs> went out the door, they were like, by the way, though, delete your LinkedIn. I was like, oh, okay, you got faith in me now. <laughs> I've never got it back hey. since. I'm not ready to rebuild yet. I imagine you would be an amazing PA. I imagine you'd be great as energy in, in an office environment. I think you would be amazing. Yeah, if you just hire me for the personality, 100%, but like not for the skills. Like, honestly, I've got ADHD and I can't even believe that I managed to be a PA for the years that I did because like, I it's can't all even answer my own emails. And it's yeah. all about organisation. Yeah, it's bad. I, I actually, I think I lied and said I was going to look for a venue for a talent show and actually went to my Love Island interview. Because you're in there for like three hours. And I remember my bosses were like messaging like, why have you been so long? And I'm like, you know, just still having a walk around. Like they're really nice. <laughs> still and having a walk <laughs> around. What is the Love Island interview process like? Do they so, just ask you, what do they ask you? It's just like the basic things like, what's your most embarrassing story? Or like, you know, yeah. um, if someone else walked in the villa, would you be willing to take their man? Or like stuff like that. My God. And I'm just like, whatever you want to hear. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you want. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I'll just do it. <laughs> but I like your honesty about it, right? Because I think sometimes, and also I, I love the fact that you say you loved it. I go back to the same thing, right? Which I, again, I said before, but the coolest thing I've ever seen, 
right, is when Harry Styles, and I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, got up on stage and he won the Grammy or the Brit or whatever it was. And he said, I want to say thank you to the X Factor. I want to say thank you to my four brothers, you know, Liam, Niall, all that kind of stuff. He could have said anything. And yeah. you get so many people who talk, and maybe they've had a terrible experience, I get it, but they talk badly about Made in Chelsea or whatever they've done. They're like, oh, God, I can't. But actually, no, it's like your history and your roots and what you've done. And, yeah. and that's cool to like acknowledge it. In yeah. certain ways. For so long with me and Chelsea, I was a bit like, oh, God, I don't really know. But actually, I'm freaking proud of that shit. Of course. And, and it gave us the platform to now move on to do potentially more serious stuff that can help people in general. But that's where you started. Like, I remember being on Love Island and every day was just a blessing. I'd wake up and think, brilliant. Like, another day. I've definitely had another 50K followers today. <laughs> like, every, every morning I'd wake up there, my office desk got further away in my brain and like all of the free stuff that I'd be receiving soon <laughs> began to just materialise. And uh, oh I, I loved the vibe, but I also loved that I knew my whole life was going to change just from being there. What was the reason behind, why did you want to do that? Um, literally, I, I would have liked to have met someone. Honestly, I've always really wanted to just meet someone and settle down, but I've just never really met the right person. So I genuinely obviously did want to find love, but I also wanted the followers and the free shit. So it was just like a big mix <laughs> of all of it, really. Talk to me, okay, about love. Are you, are you, have you fallen in love before? I think so, yeah. You yeah. think so? I think I've been in love before, yeah. I don't know. Like, I've never thought I was going to marry someone or anything like that, but I've definitely been in love with people, yeah. Why do you think you're going to marry someone? Because I just haven't met the one that I thought, wow, this could really work. Really? Yeah, I just, I seem to go for the wrong wrong people, people that just aren't going to be good for me. And, like, sometimes I'll have so many people that, so many men that are, like, on paper, like, just perfect for me. And it's like, why are you not attracted to them? And I always just tend to be attracted to people that are just not Arsles. really... Yeah, like, most of the time. Like, it's got better in recent years, but it's definitely an issue for me. But it's something I've acknowledged and it's something I'm working on. And I'm putting out to the universe what aspects I'm looking for in a partner now. And they're, they're a lot different to what they used to be. Okay, so what did you used to look for compared to now? Oh, probably just someone that was funny and like, I don't know, someone that was a bit arrogant, someone that was the center of attention, like yeah. always just like, yeah, I guess the loudest one in the room. I wouldn't mind having some of those aspects still, but I'm also looking for someone that's patient, caring, someone that shows up for me, you know, someone that's loyal, mm. someone that's calm. Like, I feel like so many of my relationships have been with people that are just all over the place and just not calm and are argumentative and I'm not really an argumentative person. I'm I'm actually quite chill. So relationships are hard when you're just arguing all the time. Yeah, one hundred percent. Especially over nothing. And it's like I just don't see the point. Like it's just never ending. So so what do you what do you really value in life now? What would you say that you you hold your values are? You say like this is what I am and I and I think that's a really good thing to be. Does that make sense? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, Give as in like an what do you value? So for example, when I was younger, right, I didn't realise what was important now what I realized what's really important in life is that I realized that family is fundamentally one of yeah. the most important things but for so many years I just completely rejected my family because I just wanted to go and do my own thing I realized that reliability and loyalty is so good and also how important having friends is yeah I was always for so long I did because I was doing MIC always looking friends was like okay I've got this group of friends okay who am I I was always looking at different groups yeah. of friends seeing what I can do and I realized that just such a you need those connections in life. Yeah, because otherwise it takes up all your time as well. How important are your friends to you? Oh, so important. I mean, I've got the same group of girlfriends that I've had since I was like 12. So, really? Yeah, all from school. And like none of them are in the industry that I'm in. Like they all do like fashion and stuff like that. One's a nanny. But I'm very, very lucky to know that like if the world fell apart, I would always have them. I think they say once it gets past like... 10 years or something, you're, you're going to be friends for life. Yeah. But one thing I really value now is authenticity and just being the best version of yourself and not trying to be like anyone else or edit yourself in any way. I think when I first would come off of Love Island, I would like overly edit my pictures. Like I would use like Facetune and Face App for a little bit of time. And, you know, I thought that portraying a better version of me is what I needed to do. And it took me a little while to realize that actually just being the most natural, authentic version of you 
is the most attractive version of you you can ever be. And that's how you will sort of get things from the universe that you want just by really just being honest. I would definitely say you're really authentic because typically when you see, when you chat to people, anyone, right, people are scared to say, I went on to get the followers and I wanted free shit. Yeah. But that's true. Of course that's what people want yeah. as well. I remember for so long people said, why did you Made in Chelsea? And I was like, oh, because I thought it would be like a fun experience. Said, Fuck no, I just wanted it. <laughs> it would be wicked to be famous for a bit. Like, yeah, like, exactly. like that's typically actually the, the, the leading thing. Yeah. I think authenticity but it's hard to teach yourself to be authentic because yeah. we're so scared about what people are going to find out about ourselves that we feel like we can't be authentic. Yeah, and that's also where, and I know I keep coming back to it, but meditation helps as well because it, it's usually the thoughts in your mind that can stray you away from being an authentic version of yourself. But if you can learn to silence the thoughts, then you can really just speak freely and from your intuition and from your core instead of like this little voice coming in your head saying, do you think you look all right right now though? Or do you think you're being funny enough? Or do you think... Like meditation can help you just silence your thoughts and just be in the present moment. Do you think you're st still, do you have insecurity still? Oh yeah, of course I do. I think, I think everyone does, especially women. Yeah. I think women struggle the most from insecurities. And like I've seen quite a few YouTubes of some of the most beautiful, amazing women in history. And they show all different clips of them saying, you know, oh, I don't think I'm pretty or I didn't think I looked nice then. Or, you know, I think everyone does that. And I'll always look back on pictures of myself from like, three years ago or something. And I'll know for a fact that night, I really didn't think I looked good. And I really beat myself up about how I looked. And then I'll look back and I'll think, mate, you looked unbelievable. Like, mm. why did it take so long for you to think that? So now when I do think things like that, when I'm out, like if I'm concerned about certain things on my appearance, I'll just think, you know, in five years time, you're going to look back on this night and think you looked hot as fuck. <laughs> so you might as well just have it off. Just enjoy it. <laughs> it's so true. I think guys really suffer that. But guys suffer silently. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely like, uh, I, guys are really insecure, me included. Like, we're insecure about so many different things. We just, but you definitely get to an age which I have, like, holy shit. Like, I, in my early 20s, I was so insecure about different things. Maybe that was exacerbated because of a TV show. But now in my 30s, <laughs> I'm a bit more like, Fuck, I just don't really care. Yeah, as who much. cares? Who cares? You I know, care like, so much less about absolutely everything. And it's, it's nicer. It is, isn't it? Yeah. What are your What are your thoughts on surgery? I think you know I have had surgery. I've had my boobs done, mm. and I think if it's something that you really take some time to think about and you really feel it can benefit you, then I think it's absolutely fine. But I think the issue with surgery is if people are getting just whatever they see on social media or whatever anyone else is getting just for the sake of trying to look like a completely different person. I think there's a difference to slightly enhancing yourself or changing a real insecurity to, you know, just wanting to get absolutely everything to look like someone else. Mm. Like I was, I, I put on a bit of weight when I was younger and then I lost it. So honestly, my boobs look like deflated cow waddles. They were like, <laughs> honestly, it, it, it was sad. It was sad. It was like gravity got the best of them, but they were still quite small. So, but talk me through that insecurity though, because that's because because it's an interesting one, right? Because one would say, um, okay, when you have boobs, right? Uh, so, God, I always like try not to try and step carefully here, but with boobs, if you are you doing it for yourself, are you doing it for other people? Ah, saying boobs, you oh my boobs God, I know, oh my God, boobs, like what? <laughs> but do you doing it for yourself, or are you doing it for other people when? You have those sur have surgery. Yeah, a bit of both. I, I think it's just for confidence. Like, yeah. and I think girls with small boobs look great. Mm. It was just that mine just didn't look like they had. They needed. They looked like they needed to be filled up because I'd got bigger and then I'd lost weight. So, like, I think even ter in terms of like having sex and stuff like that, that's probably something that I'd be thinking about. Like, oh, do my boobs look shit in this position? Do you know yeah, what I mean? I totally get it. Yeah, and if I'm feeling like that, then you know I don't want to always feel like that. It's something that is hard to get past. But I also think like girls with small boobs is actually really in fashion at the moment. I think it looks wicked when it comes to modeling and stuff like that. Mm. And you should only really want to change something if you really feel insecure about it and, you know, never make a split decision, like wait. It's funny. I, I spoke to my, I was to Sophie, my wife about this. She was explaining to me that when people have boob jobs, it actually in a, in a really positive way, it can change a whole shape yeah. of a woman's body. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It can totally change the way someone looks and feels and if it gives you that confidence i'm worried about surgery if, if look i i would say there's a limit to what people should be doing for sure yeah. and i think natural beauty is amazing but if you want to do something to 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 and it gives yourself more confidence 
fuck it, go and do it. Yeah, and that's what I done. I walked in, I said, look, give me the smallest pair of tits you've got. Let's go. <laughs> um, <laughs> How expensive is it? Is it expensive? Jamie, I mean, I didn't pay, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't often. But... <laughs> that... <laughs> no, but to be fair, my friend just got hers done and it was about £6,000. Jesus. But you can you can do it on finance if it's something... That, can you really? Yeah, if it's something that, that's really bothering you and you want to get done soon, I think you can pay them off on finance. So you can have like gym membership, car, rent, tits... All in, one, all in one spreadsheet. On like Wonga or whatever it's called. Yeah. You know <laughs> Jesus Christ. Judy, yeah. listen, I, I, I just seen the time. We've nearly had you for an hour. I just want to say, like, honestly speaking to you, um, firstly, thank you for being open. Like yeah. what you've been through, I can't even imagine. And as you said, feeling violated, that's the best way to put it. And I'm so happy that you're in a better place and um, that... You know, if scumbags are going to do that, they should be punished for it. And I'm so glad that it, that the person who did it was punished. Yeah, thank you. Also, if you know, if someone is a victim of uh, image-based sexual abuse, where would you go? If who would you speak to? If that, if you were suffering from that, and you know that your boyfriend or partner or friend or whoever it is has these images, and you're they're putting them out there, and you don't know what to do, where do you even go? I think the easiest thing to do is obviously just call the police immediately. Like, Because it is a crime. It is a crime now. Like, regardless of what the intent is, it is completely and utterly illegal. And once that footage gets out there, you may never be able to get it back. So even if they're to go around to the house and the partner hasn't sent it on, I'm sure as hell they're much more likely to delete it once the police knock on their door. So 100% just call the police. If it has already got out about you, still obviously do call the police because they will help get the perpetrator arrested and hopefully you'll get some justice. But there's so many charities that can also support you, even if you don't want to go to the police. So there's Not Your Porn and there's also the RV Helpline, Revenge Porn Helpline, and they're just absolutely brilliant. They can even get footage taken off for you. So... There's wow. a few places where I found my video um, online. One was on a huge porn website and it had like 2.1 million views. Oh. And no matter how many times I tried to contact them, they wouldn't take it down. And I spoke to the Revenge Porn Helpline and they got it taken down for me immediately and free of charge. A lot of companies will charge you, but these charities won't. They'll do everything to support you. And it's also so important for victims who aren't comfortable speaking about this with their friends and family that there will be people at those charities who understand what they're going through and can put them in touch with a therapist who is very mm. specific to image-based sexual abuse well done dude i, I mean i can't you did 2.1 million views on a, on a website yeah and that was just one fucking yeah. hell yeah so yeah. important and i'm so glad you you're this voice to sp spread out that's what i'm so excited for your book coming out. When is your book coming out? So it's already available on pre-sale now mm. at Waterstones. There's always a link on my Instagram and mm. you get a signed copy if you order now. But it will be out officially in October. Amazing. Yeah. I'm only going to get myself a book. I can't Hopefully wait. Hopefully it does better than yours, eh? I'm, I Trust me, I really <laughs> think it will. Um, dude, thank you so much for coming on. I Thanks. really appreciate it. Um, go and follow your, you know, Georgia on all social media apps as well. We're going to put all the links in the description below. Thank you so much for coming on. Everybody will see you next week. Goodbye! That was amazing. Oh, Jamie, I really enjoyed that.